Hello and welcome to the very first topic of this chapter. Here we will discuss these specifications and building codes. We will mainly cover three topics. First, what controls design? We will also learn the basic difference between engineering specifications and building codes. Next, we will understand why a designer should follow certain codes and specifications in their design. So let's start. What controls the design? The answer to this is very simple. Most designs are controlled by building codes and specifications. But most of the people have no idea or are confused between the basic difference between building codes and specifications. Let's clear this topic once and for all. Specifications give an opinion of certain organizations of what represents a good practice. Okay, I repeat. Specifications gives an opinion of certain organizations of what represents a good practice. On the other hand, codes are actually laws of legislations which tells us about the minimum loads, materials required, deflection criteria and other factors. Designers are bound by law to follow the codes. They are legally enforceable. So now you get the basic difference that engineering specifications just give an opinion and codes give us a certain set of rules to follow. Let's understand this by an example. So AISC and ASHTO are specifications. Okay, just for your, just for your um, information, ASHTO stands for American Association of State Highways and Transportation Officials. So you can say that AISC and ASHTO are not legally enforceable as they are just opinions made for good practice. But what makes AISC and ASHTO different is that they are adopted by building codes and hence becomes mandatory to practice. So any specifications that are adopted by building codes are legally enforceable. Now you may ask what is the difference between AISC and ASHTO? So to sum it up, most municipal and building codes have adopted AISC and most highways and transportation departments have adopted ASHTO. You would see a lot of bridge design specifications in ASHTO and a lot of building design specifications in AISC. I hope the difference between specifications and building codes is clear and that they will mostly control all designs around us. So why follow the codes? I always had this question when I was in my freshman year. I mean, we have to follow just because we are asked to follow or is there any logical reason to abide by the building codes? Let's understand. People generally think that these specifications and codes prevent their creative thinking. They might think that their solution is better than that mentioned in the books, which might be the case, but still they need to follow the codes just because they are legally enforceable. Well, there might be some basis to this discussion. Let's see what happens if we neglect the code. Let's take an example. From, uh, let's take an example from the past. Let's talk about the Great Pyramids. You might think that these pyramids were built without any set of detailed codes, still standing there for many, many years. Well, that's right. But then let's dig deep into this and try to understand the success behind the pyramids. If you pay close attention, only a very few of these historical projects have lasted. People nowadays tend to remember the great failures of different structures and, and, and not their successes. Why? The reason being that there are a very few failures in the modern era. But in the past, we only seem to remember the successes. That is because the probability of success for any project was quite slim. The best example of it is the pyramids. They were built without any regard for cost of material, labor, or even human life. They only followed certain rules of thumb. This is the exact reason why we need such provisions in place. 
we now need structures that are safe and function well throughout its life, which gives us a sense of surety about the performance of the structure. Hence, to conclude, I will say that these provisions are made not to restrict an, an uh, engineer's thinking, but to protect the public. No matter how many provisions are written, it is impossible to cover every possible design situation. As a result, no matter which provision is being used, the ultimate responsibility lies in the hand of the structural engineer. So that's it for this lecture. I hope you found it uh, interesting. Please let me know what better can I do to make these lectures even more comprehensible. I will try my best to match that. Thanks and see you in the next lecture where we discuss the loads and its types.